baby shower. It wasn't like me to just take the girls and go, but I just had all I could take of her bullshit. No, she never lied to me about Paul. No, she never mentioned Terry, but my sister Sally filled me in on that. I just couldn't live that kind of life with her any longer. Jesus, we've got kids now. Or doesn't that mean anything? It's the 90s now, and we've long since graduated from the Paisley VW van to a more discreet eggshell Volvo wagon. It was one thing when we were on the road with the band in our 20s. The bed hopping stuff was required activity in Rock and Roll 101. But we both made the jump off the lover's leap of the big 4-0 now, and the three ways and psychedelics have given way to lid lifts and tummy tucks. Yes, my monthly Greenpeace pledge is up to date, and I even marched to protest Operation Rescue at the Family Planning Center. Uh, But I had to leave early for a client lunch at Harry's. (laughs) It's one thing to see your old lady gyrating under your drummer through a marijuana fog, and quite another to see her making goo-goo eyes with the principal across the cafeteria at a PTA meeting. I don't know. To me, it kind of smacks of the depressing classifieds in those sleazy sex papers. You know, you know the oversexed, undertoned pitifuls who hide their eyes under black bars while revealing their dimpled whale flesh in column inches. So while Sunshine, yes, Sunshine, she was christened Bernice, but the spirit is eternal, was at Whole Earth shopping for wheatgrass juice and chromium picolinate, I scribbled a note heavy on hurt and blame in four- and five-letter words, threw together some clothes, and ushered Tina and Chastity into the station wagon. I told the girls their mom would meet us all at the desert and that Mima and Gramps couldn't wait to see them. I savored Sunshine's eventual anger, losing myself in the rubber and asphalt freeway symphony. Fine. It was her turn to feel something other than lust. I knew if I'd confronted her, she would have talked reason, and I'm sick of reason. It was time for a little impulse for once in my life. Okay, call it cowardice if you like. I call it survival. But then it dawned on me that a more likely reaction was passive acceptance, and I got more pissed with the Volvo cruising at a cool 85 down Freedom Road. Tina had her head out the window, her cheeks balloon pockets for desert wind. Her sister, the sensitive one, was throwing up in a bag. I guess she got the neatness trait from me. Some might call it anal retentive, but I call it tidy. The first few hours on the nearly deserted Sunshine Highway were bliss. The sky was blue, the howdy waving clouds fluffy, and the tranquility of family, however splintered, comforting. The choice was made, and being right felt righteous. The white line hypnosis set in, and despite the UV protection of my foster grant, sunshine flooded my brain. Married in the park by a universal life minister come hash broker, our life was a succession of crash pads and flesh pole vaulting. Our first house, a converted turn-of-the-century bakery with a giant plaster donut on the roof, was the big O, a perfect symbol for our relationship. Even though the bakery had lain fallow for over a decade, we still had occasional Sunday morning tourists knocking on the door and ordering jelly donuts. Saturday nights, Sunshine stayed up late making acid crullers to give out free to unsuspecting families. Our couplings were frequent all the way to the end. It was not the frequency, merely the variety and satisfaction level that waned for both of us. But while for me the pronging was replaced by ambition and breadwinning, hers was supplanted by school teachers, the Maytag man, not so lonely in our neighborhood, and even a cop, though in truth it was his wife who inspired sunshine on a labyrinthine maneuver worthy of Lucy Ricardo. Admittedly, Mrs. Bacon was a knockout, maybe even worth sleeping with a pig to rub up against, and sunshine was definitely an equal opportunity bed partner. At least she didn't sleep with our Labrador roach, though she spoke about the possibility more than once on the brink of orgasm. So maybe it's age, or growing up, or the shifting of morality, or the fear of death, or the encroachment of parenthood and the fucking legacy of the Reagan-Bush years, but I just couldn't subject the kids to any more of her sexual irresponsibility. I looked over at the girls, the beautiful miniature being so lovely and trusting and adorable. Mine. The amazement I felt over them was overwhelming. 
Yes, it's been going on as long as bipeds have trod the earth and anyone can have babies, rich or poor, black, yellow or green. But my children, parts of me made them, formed them. And despite the lack of my Y chromosome, you could see my genetic material passed on to the little squirmers. Their innocence, trust and unconditional love made me their willing prisoner. Of course, they'll hit their teens and hate and reject me, but now all they feel for me is love and respect, and I for them. Life was beginning to feel meaningful to me for the first time in years. Chastity had stopped puking, and Tina was whisper-singing to Doobie, her imaginary friend. She had my voice, I was proud to note. Maybe it would serve her better than it had me... My folks hadn't seen the girls since Christmas, and I knew they'd be thrilled by them. There was always a kinship there. Tina had her Mima's eyes, sheer black and white windows of intelligence. No visible irises, just whites punctured by ebony pupils, haunting and piercing. Chastity had her mother's eyes, green and gold, one of each. Mine were like my father's, if it matters. Ice water blue, pale and failing, his glasses were so thick his eyes seemed the size of baseballs behind them, and I resigned myself to his fate. You couldn't get contact lenses if your eyes were that bad. The lenses would be so thick you couldn't blink over them. So I thought it would be fun to sing together on our vacation and belted out some Beatles. The girls didn't know any of the words and didn't seem particularly interested either. Same with CSN and Y. Gentle Giant, The Move... And I sure as hell didn't know any songs by their favorites, the Butthole Surfers. Sublime? Give me a break. How can you sing that crap anyway? That's not music. It's just a bunch of noise. What happened to songs you could sing? Of course, they didn't get that from Sunshine either. Her taste runs to the folky boars. Joni Mitchell, Richie Havens. In fact, one of her most alluring attributes when I met her was the claim that she'd just aborted a Richie Havens fetus the week before. So I let them play a snot rag tape until they spotted a jack-in-the-box and the hunger zone kicked in. We drove Gila Ben Jack crazy with our shouted orders, feeling a little electric zizz of guilt for the mountain of cholesterol that lay before us. Back home, the girls and I would sneak out of Sunshine's macrobiotic jail cell every week or so to indulge in deep-fried fantasies, some good old American processed sugar heavily breaded and salted. Tina, the practical one, did order the chicken sandwich, though, because it, it came on a whole wheat bun. We ate, and I drove. It got dark, and they slept. It felt like we were surely losing our way, that there couldn't be civilization out here in the dunes and two-lane blacktop. But no, Mom's directions were quite explicit. The Volvo bisected the desert and eventually nosed the ruby dawn sun into the sky. There it was, like the opening titles of Close Encounters. Now entering Ponce de Leon, Nevada. Population 213. I wanted to turn around. Ponce de Leon was sand and pool supply stores and health food parlors and mobile homes and sand and a church and a post office and sand and old people. All old people bustling about the little clot of civilization like the Disneyland at the doorstep to St. Peter's Gates. If any of these morning folk were under 80 or so, you wouldn't know by looking. I pulled off the fountain of youth Presidio and onto Rejuvenation Road. Dad was right. I couldn't and didn't miss it. The Volvo wheezed and crunched up the rock driveway in front of their mobile estate, and I was suddenly aware of silence. The hours of engine hum burrowed through the head cheese of my brain and left its ghost within. The silence took time to adapt to. I reached for the seatbelt and noticed for the first time that a roll of flab lay over it. I actually had to lift my belly up to unbuckle and the queeze of embarrassment and self-loathing welled up underneath. Of course, Dad wouldn't say anything. He, he's as wide as he is tall, and from what Sally had said, not in the best of health. The girls were coming to life. But before they could get out, Are we there yet? Mom and Dad were out of the trailer and onto the courts. 
I wasn't so sure I was at the right place at first. And then I thought that pod people had replaced my parents with a frightfully malformed simulation. But as they grew close, baseball eyes a-sparkle, there was no doubting. Oh, mom was mom. You, you know, silver hair, hennaed orange, polyester stretch pants, black bustier, and that roadmap face creased by decades of cigarettes and after-hours living. Old, but still mom. But Dad was another story. If he hadn't been squeezing Mom's butt with excitement, I'd have guessed she was flinging with the carnation man. It looked like he'd just unzipped and stepped out of a dad suit. He was no longer the egg man, not even the walrus. He'd shed his Siamese twin and become downright skinny. Old man skinny, leathery from the sun, his dentures glinting against the brown, dry skin that crinkled into a jolly smile. I looked down and sucked in my gut, but they didn't seem to notice. They were too busy beaming. Look at those babies, Mom squealed and grabbed the girls, rubbing their apple cheeks against her crepe paper face. The girls looked at me with big, keen painting eyes, and I gave them a nod. They gingerly hugged back. Dad saw me checking them out. Notice I dropped a couple of pounds, did you? You look... Great! Both of you! Mom was sensitive. Mom didn't even look at me. She was squeezing the love out of her granddaughters. Oh, these little girls! Chastity was offended. I'm a young lady, she pouted. Well, oh my, yes! It was the first time I noticed that my parents were old. Yes, they were in their 70s, but they were always just mom and dad, forever 35. But I saw them as strangers and found them old, elderly, aged seniors. And they said old people things like, Oh my, yes! Well, for gosh sakes, Dad's old man impression again. Come on in and get some grub. Mima's been cooking it up since before sunup. Old people always start doing things before sunup, don't they? And they go to bed before the news and keep the thermostat up above 80. Mom and Dad were old. What a concept. Breakfast was a concept that made me uncomfortable. After hefting the spare tire to unleash myself from the front seat, I, I really wasn't hungry. I've, uh, <clears throat> I've put on a couple of pounds. I hemmed, rocking on rounded heels, hoping no one would notice. Hope sprung eternal, and we were soon gathered round Mom's repast. Well, the mobile home dining room looked like the brunch at the Royal Hawaiian, the table groaning under a repast that could feed the proverbial troops. Tropical fruits, omelets, sausages, steaks, muffins, and every other bowel-blocking masterpiece Mom could conjure up, all under the fishnets and flowers of the islands. Mom, uh, Dad called her Nani Loa now, was on her King Kamehameha kick now, and the garden isle was everywhere. She seems to go in king cycles. When I was a kid, it was Midas. She spray-painted everything gold. Since Attila and his Huns weren't expected, we correctly assumed that we were expected to consume the ingestibles. My stomach gurgled. Tina's eyes widened. She tippy-toed up to whisper in my ear, I'm concerned about my cholesterol intake, Daddy. My dad, even without the hearing aid, picked up on it. Then you just stick with the fruits and the turkey sausage, Pee-wee. She liked Pee-wee. He turned to Chastity. How you doing, Princess? I could tell that Princess was pretty lame to the Nickelodeon and MTV addle, but her gap-tooth grin through masticated hash browns showed she liked them anyway. I always called her Chaz because Sunshine couldn't resist calling her Titty. I guess even Princess beats Titty. The wicker chair grunted like a rusted gate when I took my seat, and my best friend, old Mr. Gilt, reared his ubiquitous head. Uh, don't go off your diet for us. <laughs> Mom smiled a mommy grin. What diet is that? More guilt. A faux pas. A foot and mouth. Well, uh, <laughs> you and Dad have dropped some of that excess baggage, so I thought, y you know. It was Dad's turn for laughter.
despite the lack of a bowl full of jelly to shake. What was so fucking funny? Nobody diets in Ponce de Leon. It's that good desert air, clean living, late to bed and early to rise, activity, wholesome food. But his real wink-wink keep this to yourself secret to everlasting health? At least one good BM every day. Chaz and Tina knew from BMs and giggled. Even I was starting to relax. The meal progressed and I began to remember family, the blood link that bound us and the happiness it provided. Its fragile handle-with-care glass was shattered on the kitchen tile by sunshine and all it took was dinner with Mima and Gramps to glue it back together. I watched the meat. They blossomed in the role of hosts and despite their age looked more beautiful than I remembered them. All of us dive-bombed the steaming platters of conspicuous consumption. I sneaked the occasional peek at them. I saw Mom flush and give Dad an embarrassed, loving wink, and Dad's hand slid under the tablecloth, staying under and spraying Mom's apple cheeks an even brighter shade of crimson. I had to look away. They were my parents. Ponce de Leon agreed with them. I was happy for them in their marriage. They never acted like this when I lived at home. He seemed so close and loving and life-affirming that it brought me back to the dark side of sunshine and the depression she wrought. Soon I was ready for my own good BM and a nap, so the folks took the girls out for some frozen yogurt. The long drive from California coupled with the gargantuan meal suddenly hit me like a time-release Valium and I went in to lie down. It felt spectacular to slide naked under a clean, white, non-tie-dyed sheet in the crisp, dry Nevada heat. It was too dry to sweat, and my pores prickled into excited goose flesh as they made contact with the slick cotton. My nerve endings were puckered and heightened, and despite the exhaustion, my body felt covered with sensitive erectile tissue. Alone in the goldening desert sunlight, an erection raged as never before. Perhaps my little partner sensed his release and stood proud and independent. But I was slipping in and out of slumber, and when my hand found it and fumbled, it melted. When my faltering dream brain realized nothing was going to happen, I dropped it. I woke up in the dark, not quite sure where I was, my brain smothered in molasses, my fist clenched round my penis. Uh, then I remembered where I was and why, and the irrational fear gave way to another attempt at self-gratification. I squeezed a few times, but the effort was non-committal. Too much like work. And I looked up to see little Tina's silhouette watching me from the doorway. Want some, Daddy? She asked me in that adorable little cartoon girl voice. It's Peach. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yogurt. Uh, no, no, thank you, teen. My face burned red, but with luck it didn't glow in the dark. Uh, Dad's taking a nap, okay? Sunshine used to dance around the house in the buff all the time, saying how it was so healthy for the kids, but even under cover of the sheet I was embarrassed. Besides, even though she never exercised, Sunshine had a perfect body, the bitch. And I had this spare tire. Can I watch you sleep? In my haze, I had forgotten my little girl was still there. Uh, no, please, honey, it, it's not polite. Just let me sleep a little while longer, okay? She understood polite and left me alone. I just couldn't wake up and didn't really want to. I was out immediately to dream of standing fat and naked in a beauty contest with Chippendale dancers, <laughs> and Sunshine was the judge. I awoke in a puddle of my own sweat, drenched as if I'd just climbed out of a swimming pool. The heat that put me to sleep now hung oppressively over me in the night. The trailer's darkness was pierced only by the blue light of the television, the silence broken only by its high, dog-level electronic squeal. It drilled through my groggy head. I got up to find the girls asleep in their sleeping bags in front of the Playboy channel. The sound was off, as if they thought they could get away with something. And they did. 
But the squeal of the picture tube was an ice pick through my brain, and uh, I switched it off. The room was totally dark now, and I just stood in the middle of it, feeling the darkness blanket me. Everything was still and quiet in the desert. So far removed from life in the big city, it felt like there were earplugs in my ears, as if silence can only be achieved through muffling sounds out, not by eliminating them. It felt claustrophobic. Mom and Dad were gone, and with the girls sleeping, I felt very alone and melancholic. Careful not to trip over them, I walked outside. Shaking the dumb fog of sleep from my brain, I stood under a magnificent sky lit by a full moon and a buffet of pinprick constellations. I found myself breathing deeper out here than in the city, filling my lungs with the rich oxygen mix of the desert, the cilia that lines my lungs, screaming out for more and more of the intoxicant. After hours of driving and more of sleeping, my muscles had contracted, and it felt good to uncocoon them. I stretched and walked, and my feet tingled as blood filled them. My mind breathed and wandered as I walked with my hands in my pockets, kicking the loose gravel that was the street. It was a stroll blessed by solitude and reflection, and bitterness dried up with my sweat in the light, palmy breeze. Turning onto the Presidio, blissful isolation also evaporated into the night heat. Ponce de Leon's main drag was buzzing with night lifers. All 213 raisined citizens were out on the street, drinking, dancing, carousing, and just having one hell of a time. Disneyland, to the contrary, this was the happiest place on earth. I stood at their periphery, alone, apart from them more than just geographically, and envied them their joy. Drops splashed on the gravel at my feet, and I wondered if it could rain from a clear sky. But the rain was falling from my eyes. I felt like an illegal alien. The dress code was the elderly inevitable. Plaid walk shorts with Hawaiian shirts and black socks with brown shoes for the men. Tight polyester pedal pushers with stirrups with short sleeve white blouses for the ladies. The bolder amongst them wore only bras on top, acknowledging the heat and liberalism of the desert. But one thing took a little while to become apparent. There wasn't an overweight soul among them. I had to chew on that for a moment or two. Have you ever been in a group of senior citizens where no one was at least a little pleasingly plump? You know, it's not their fault. Metabolisms change and all. But it seems to me that old folks are always either over or underweight. These were the slimmest, trimmest oldies I, I'd ever seen. My age made me an outsider, but it was my paunch that made me most uncomfortable among them. Not that these were all fitness fanatics, mind you. Some of them were downright skinny, their flesh hanging from their skeletons like crepey draperies. And they were eating and drinking like there was no tomorrow. And from the looks of some of them, there wasn't. Somehow these folk could down all the yogurt, banana splits, strawberry daiquiris, and grasshopper pies they wanted and never pay for their Epicurean sins. I can indulge occasionally, but not without a visit from old man Gilt or his brother, Mr. Pounds. But the elderly citizens of Ponce de Leon flourished in a kind of gray sin city of overindulgence. It was as if that desiccating sun melted their fat and evaporated it. Didn't want to be there when it finally rained. I was sweating again. It ran in salty rivers off my body, only to dry in the breeze. I really wanted to take a shower, especially now that I found myself entering this hot spot. A particularly jolly group stopped me and smiled with recognition. Say, the old man said, poking me in the chest, you're Dick and Paula's boy, aren't you? Oh, good. <laughs> they were expecting me. The man had a good-looking older woman on each side, and he winked conspiratorially, knowing I'd noticed. How could I not? One of the women was particularly well endowed and kept them holstered only in a sheer brassiere that showed her nipples. I tried not to look, especially because they cleaved in papery creases, but exposed nipples are exposed nipples, and they are made for eye contact, elderly or otherwise. 
She knew I noticed, could probably feel the heat from my scorching blush and her nipples puckered with her smile. I remembered a time in the fifth grade when my ancient teacher leaned down to chastise me and I peeked down her dress at the creased, hanging, deflated water balloons that dangled from her chest in wrinkled sacks. I was disgusted by the sight, but stimulated by the idea of bare breasts. Pavlov's dog barked, and I could feel swelling down below. The other woman was dressed more chastely. She actually wore a blouse. She smiled, too, naughtily blinking giant come hither eyes behind her inch-thick eyeglasses. I wondered if the bright sun could accidentally burn her face through the lenses. Maybe these were just her nighttime glasses. But it was time to speak. Uh, you folks having <laughs> some kind of festival? What's the occasion? The three of them giggled. Occasion, the old man said with some surprise. Hell, it's Tuesday. That a good enough reason? We kick up a fuss every night, except Sunday. Never on Sunday. We're as irresponsible as all get out, <laughs> aren't we girls? Especially Susie here. Susie, uh, with the boobs, giggled and actually goosed the old guy, I swear to God. And he squealed like a stuck pig. The goosing grandma's lascivious smile told me it was more for my benefit than the goosies. The townlet was really jumping now, a geriatric woodstock under a vast, deep blue tapestry of night. Lots of lights, friendliness, and despite the awkwardness I felt here, everyone was doing their best in their own way to make me feel welcome. I scanned the horizon. Have you seen my parents? Lascivious Susie boobs gave a nasty sort of grin. Who hasn't? The old guy seemed to cut her off. Not tonight, son. He gave Susie a look. No, not tonight, Susie agreed. Not tonight. Uh uh-uh, uh, the eyes echoed. But I'm sure they're around, Pop said. You have yourself a time. And they rejoined the party. I wandered through Ponce de Leon, amazed by the overwhelming joie de vivre in the air. Under other circumstances, this could be contagious, but I was busy chewing my anger and hurt, savoring and nursing some festering hatred, and that felt better to me than any love of life could. But I partook of the town's pleasures nonetheless. A yogurt shake here, a margarita there, a couple of shots of tequila somewhere else, and frankly, I could not keep the anger in place. Before long, it fizzed and went flat like an open bottle of Perrier in the fridge, or in the oven, more precisely. At any rate, the pain had worked itself to a dull throb, and even that was getting hard to feel. Damn it. So I continued to walk the boulevard, exchanging howdies, a yogurt sundae in one hand, a grasshopper in the other, and a shit-eating grin plastered across my face. I was a mirror to all those smiles that walked up to me, near-perfect, man-made porcelain choppers that spoke to me, welcomed me, chattered, birthed tongue snakes and jolly sounds and big, enveloping funhouse laughs that drilled through my alcohol overcoat and into my dying brain. Faces were watching me everywhere, don't tell me they weren't, and I'd have climbed the high dive to jump into their pit. I reached the end of the main drag, becoming one with the citizenry of Ponce de Leon, and stood in front of a mysterious black concrete mock structure. No sign, no lights, but it it looked like a bar. And there was a steady stream of customers entering, and very few finding their way up. Look good to me. (laughs) I love a mystery. There was a heavy black curtain blocking the doorway, and the thought that there was something to hide inside made it all the more appealing. I hefted the curtain and stuck in my head, only to come face to school cafeteria worker face with a grumpy-looking lady with her white hair pulled back in a netted bun. She greeted me brusquely. You don't want to see this, son. On the contrary, I really did want to see this, especially now. She protested. This is a private club and blah, blah, blah. I think it was the tequila that shoved her aside with the $10 bill in her D-cup. Couldn't have been me. It all seemed so seductively seedy that I couldn't resist its irresistible force. 
This was hardly one of those roadside sucker traps with a cage and a baby rattlers sign that turns out to have toy rattles inside. No, this place offered more than its money's worth. I made my way down a long corridor that emptied out into a dark, smoky den filled with hot-blooded oldies groping one another. Something more than the desert air had heated these reprobates to the point of spontaneous combustion. The fountain of youth emptied out into this primordial pool, and men and women had their hands and mouths behind zippers and buttons in places you'd wash before and after touching. It must have been 300 degrees in there, and it was getting hotter. The faces of the groping groupers were not on one another. No, they're... Eyes were all aimed in one direction as they fondled their way to heaven. They were all watching a tiny, intimate stage at the front of the room. My head turned in 100 frames per second, Scorsese slow motion. And my heart stopped. This was the show to end all shows, the greatest show on earth, quintessence, the pièce de résistance. My mother... And father, the Ward and June Cleaver of the Carpenter household, were buck-naked, rutting like missionary weasels wide open for business. I was staring into the conjoined plumbing that launched me into orbit on Spaceship Earth, rocking to a steadier beat than Charlie Watts ever hit. My mother and father, Dick and Paula, all flesh and hair and perspiration, were fucking on stage for an audience. Dad looked up at me in mid-stroke with an expression that I may have mistook for embarrassment and said, I thought you were home sleeping. I wished. Keeping down my gorge, I ran outside, crashing clumsily through the dry, scraping sound of elderly applause. I tore through the streets, my head spinning spinning and felt the sky growing around me. It grew dense and heavy, pregnant with something spectacular as I ran through the staring faces along the Presidio. Grandparents were turning their faces from me to the gathering thunderheads, and the town, or merely my senses, hushed into funereal expectant silence. I continued to run from them. The time-lapsed sky was black with wet, spongy, nimbus clouds, which ripped open with a frightening roar, suddenly dumping sheets of bath-warm water to the parched, sandy ground. Old people were screaming in my wake back in town like they thought they were the Wicked Witch of the West, afraid of melting like they do in Oz. Lightning cracked and arced overhead, igniting the night sky and leading me back to the mobile estate. The girls are terrified by lightning and thunder, and I had to get back to them in their real world and hold them in my arms and feel them breathe, their little hearts beating a double tattoo against my chest and smell their little kid fear scent and make everything real and okay for them and them for me. I had to forget what I'd seen. The street behind me emptied of life in moments, and was soon the fountain of youth river. It slowed me, sobered me <laughs> like I needed that, and I followed the lightning to Grandma's house. When I crashed through the front door, the girls were hugging in front of David Letterman, terrified. They looked up at me and leapt into my arms, shivering, their little bodies covered in goose flesh. I really felt like a daddy as I held them, kissed them, and told them rain stories may have been the most intimate family gathering we'd ever had. The rain was relentless, the cats and dogs long since graduating to elephants and giraffes. The girls went to bed with me, and we all fell asleep pretending to be lying under Yosemite Falls. Somebody kicked the dream reception unit into overdrive, and as the torrents of rain battered the trailer's metal roof, visions of sunshine battered in my brain. She was lying on a giant round waterbed, birthing our babies and licking them clean, the ultimate earth mother. She nursed the still wet Tina as chastity was sliding out the canal. But there was more to follow. Me. I watched my own adult head come gasping out from between her legs and saw the fluids gushing out round me. I emerged, naked, wet, and crying 
five foot ten, balding, and with a prominent spare tire. Then I was the other me, the one crawling out from between her legs, and saw that we were on the little stage of the weird club on the Presidio, and an excited, masturbating audience of toothless senior citizens made wet, gummy noises of approval. I cried and turned to Mother Earth, but there was a baby at each breast and no teat for me. Suddenly my face purpled and the heat was overpowering, as it was in the trailer when I finally awoke in the middle of the next afternoon. The rain had evidently ceased some time ago, leaving in its wake a stuffy, sultry afternoon. The soft silence in the otherwise empty trailer was soothing at first, but grew intimidating, almost frightening. When I stood up from sweat-soaked sheets, my head spun and I almost had to collapse. Surrendering to an overwhelming call of nature, I retreated to the bathroom and let loose my own river of no return. I felt relieved of several pounds by the time I flushed and looked in the full-length mirror. What happened to my love handles? I mean, it wasn't Arnold Schwarzenegger staring back at me from the glass, but it seemed my paunch of insecurity had fled, leaving me svelte round the belt. Overnight... Light-headed and lighter-bodied, I felt as if I might float as I made my way to the ethereal silence of the living room. My mom and dad weren't there. Neither were the girls. I had no problem, I told myself, though my intuitive self was less reasonable. Nausea rode up my gorge, and I went outside. The silence was overwhelming. The air was still and heavy, the desert sands motionless, the sun cradled in a cloudless blue frame, but the arid wasteland of Ponce de Leon, Nevada, had been transformed, had become a wonderland of tropical fauna. What was court sand was now something green and ubiquitous, a feathery tendrilled vine, an instant Kudzu, just add water, like those magic rocks you grow in fish bowls. In the hot sun, you could actually see steam rising from the thick jungle stuff, and my jaw lolled several inches down my chest. And if you watch closely enough, you can actually see this stuff growing. There was not a living soul to be seen in the trailer park. In the middle of the afternoon... <laughs> in the middle of the jungle. Intuitive me took command, and I panicked. Where was my family? The Volvo was still there. Maybe they walked into town. It wasn't so far. I'd done it myself the night before. I jumped behind the wheel and tried to start the car without success. It didn't even bother to growl at me before giving up the ghost just a click and that awful desert silence. I got frantic and started running house to house. I, I, I mean trailer to trailer. My parents and my babies were gone, and so were the other inhabitants of Ponce de Leon. No, no one was home, and I ran down the gravel road into town. It was a jungled ghost town, devoid of any but vegetable life and mineral death. Not an animal in the mix. The creeping greenery breathed its steamy exhaust over the dead and drying community as it enveloped it, covered it dressed it for dinner. Where were my babies? I broke into shops and homes and already rusting cars and RVs, but the town had been abandoned. It looked like a 1950s nuclear test site, but without even the Aussie and Harriet dummies standing in the kitchen for the illusion of life. My throat was raw from screaming for the girls, and I felt the hundreds of square miles of desert surrounding me closing in, squeezing my jigsaw brain, baking me and basting me in my own juices, my scalp sizzling and scrambling in the late day sun. I trod back that long road to the Mobile Estate. I stood looking at my parents' trailer without the heart to enter. It was a desert tomb, and waves of heat rose from its roof as it reflected the slowly setting sun. And then a, a face appeared at the window. Two. Chastity and Tina. I ran in, 
and they ran out, and we collided at the door and around the lay of hugs and frightened kisses. Where is everybody, Tina asked me, and I, I couldn't give her an answer. I couldn't be a real father. All I could tell her was the truth. I don't know. And I couldn't fix it for her. But anything else they needed, well, I was there and theirs. And we went back inside where they'd turned the air conditioner on high and I held them for hours until we fell asleep waiting for Mima and Gramps. The next day fell on us, finding us alone and deserted. We had power, color TV, food, and a roof over our heads, but no phones and no way out. We were stuck in the middle of nowhere, pioneers, prisoners of the sun, surrounded by its sea of dunes. All we could do was wait and watch the desert kudzu creep. Dad had a huge stock of Dos Equis, and I made a ferocious dent in his collection. I don't know how many days we spent making do, but I remember that even the kudzu was beginning to go brown and crispy in the heat when I discovered the girl's new secret. I was nursing Dos Equis numero cinco in the beer chair when I heard them talking and giggling outside. Something told me they were talking to someone, not to each other. I tried without success to hear the third voice. Curiosity picked me up by the scruff of the neck, and I dipped round the side of the trailer, crunching through the thick ground cover. They heard me, and their little heads jerked round guiltily, and I knew they were hiding something. I stood at full, intimidating daddy height in front of them and asked what they were hiding. The power play was successful. They silently parted and revealed something squirming in a bundled blanket on the foliage. I looked at them, cautious. Uh, will it bite? <laughs> so much for intimidation. They just giggled. Of course not, Daddy, said a very sophisticated chastity. So I hesitantly crouched down and opened the bundle. It was alive. It was pink and sweating in the heat. It was a baby. A beautiful, perfect, bald-headed, wincy-fingered little boy. I marveled at his perfect miniature fingernails, his wrinkled little tootsies, his toothless gums, and his crystal clear, ice water blue eyes, just like mine and Dad's. But the biggest marvel was its very existence. Whose baby is this? I, I needed to know. Uh, where did he come from? It's ours, Tina announced, a little petulant. This is not your baby. I knew they weren't that precocious. W where is Mommy and Daddy? Ain't got none, said Chaz. No grown-ups around here but you. Don't say ain't, Tina scolded, then giggling. It ain't proper. I had to put this back on track. I mean it now. Where did your little friend come from? Where did you get him? Chaz sighed. From the new forest, Daddy, as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. Of course, the new forest. Then Tina posed a curious question. Do you think storks come here for vacation, Dad? Hmm. I had to see this new forest, and the girls led the safari. I carried the baby, wondering what kind of forest could exist in this reconditioned bomb site. But there we were. Lawrence of Ponce de Leon and his family, out on the green but browning dunes, zigzagging across the desert till we reached the oasis. It was a little valley, lush with vegetation, suddenly 20 degrees cooler than the 106-degree hike. We sat in the shade of a strange pink tree that reached out to give us comfort with branches which waved in a growing breeze. The baby was wriggling like a little worm, and I let him crawl across the vegetation, he moved to a soft mound at the base of another tree and rolled around in the thick clump of baby tear that grew green and moist in the shade. Then he stopped, gave a drooling giggle of excitement. The little mound moved. Tina and Chastity squealed with excitement. They knew what was going on if I didn't. It's happening, Chaz shouted. Another one is coming up. The baby just giggled and goo-gooed as the mound continued to rumble. The girls ran closer and I reached up to pull them away. They ignored me and ran right back. I just stared at the mound with them, bewildered and expectant and a little scared. The sod puckered. 
been ripped open from within. Crumbles of soil came from underneath. Something was climbing out of the dirt. Tentatively, I moved closer, then immediately jumped back as something thrust up through the soil, reaching high into the arid sky. A tiny, shriveled, pink-white human hand. Shivering with excitement, the girl started to dig the dirt away while the baby at my feet just watched and gurgled happily. Tina and Chastity swaddled the new baby in an old T-shirt, brushing the soil from its skin. Oh boy, Tina exclaimed, it's a girl! Look at her eyes, said Chaz. They're like Tina's. Yep, black and white eyes, just like Tina's, just like her grandmother's. The little boy just looked up at us with his calm, ice-blue eyes and smiled like he knew us. He was happy to have another like him, and waddled over to be with the new little baby. They both looked at us, and it was obvious that they'd be a part of the family. There was certainly a familial resemblance you didn't even need to look close to see. It took some getting used to. The girls seemed relieved to not have to keep it secret any longer. What could I do, punish them? So it wasn't long before they told me about the others, the dozens of babies they were watching over in other homes scattered throughout the community, and there were no doubt more on the way. We have the two living with us in the trailer, and they are a handful enough. Imagine what it's like tending to all the others. There's no time for boredom. But Richard and Paula are the best and the brightest. They are family and united we stand. The girls love them, have their own pet names. Richard is Peewee, and to Tina, Paula is Naniloa. Every so often when the night is blue-black and pocked with stars, we tell the little ones of how the rains fell on Rejuvenation Road and washed it clean for us. (laughs) But I think they knew the story better than we did.